Welcome to the Deconstructing Data Podcast. I'm Jesse Lezak, CMO at BDEX, along with co-host David Finkelstein, BDEX's co-founder and CEO. Hi, David. How's it going? Uh, hello. I'm recording live today from Coral Springs instead of Sanibel, unfortunately. You know, I got a notice, I've never gotten this before on StreamYard, that we may be having an error on LinkedIn so I'm looking at LinkedIn right now and it's showing that it's live, but if anyone's watching and they want to plug into the comments to let us know, we're also on YouTube. So if you head over to bdex.com, you can just click on our YouTube page and find this live there as well. And also David's Twitter, it's live on David's Twitter as well. So if you are having issues, you can find it there and it'll be on podcast later. But um, let, why don't we go ahead and bring in our guest? So today's guest is Elizabeth Har. She goes by Liz, senior partner at Hinge. She draws on 20 years as an accomplished executive and entrepreneur, as well as her experience in operations, management, and brand development to help her clients get to the next level of growth um, in their entire firm's evolution. So let me pull her in here. Hi, Liz. It's Hello. great to meet you. Good to meet you. Yeah, great to meet you, Liz. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. So if you don't mind, could you please start from the beginning and tell us your story? And also, could you please tell listeners a little about Hinge and how you help people there? Sure. So I, probably like a lot of people, I feel like my path in a way has nothing to do with what I do now. And in a way, it has everything to do. So uh, you know, first I'll say, uh, neither my academic background nor my professional background really has anything to do with marketing in a formal manner. My master's is in economics, so pretty far away from marketing. Uh, I speak Japanese and work with the Japanese government for a while, and I thought, that's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And, you know, as, as many people know, doors open and you uh, get experiences introduced to you. So I just kind of found my way into the world of growing companies. Um, somewhere along the way, I co-founded a tech firm and I just, I just loved the strategy involved in growth. And um, I really loved doing that. And I did that for uh, almost 10 years. I navigated it through the uh, financial or the market collapse in uh, 08 and 09. And then it came time for my chapter two. And while I had that tech firm, you know, I had met a lot of great people, I was kind of networking, I actually became a client of the company I'm a partner at today, Hinge. And uh, so when I when it came time for my chapter two, and I wanted to do something very different, I was talking with the owners of Hinge, and the more I talked about what I love doing, which is about company growth, and the more they talked about what they were doing with Hinge, we thought, oh, we have to work together. So now I've been at uh, Hinge for about 12, almost 12 years. And what I started out loving doing and just did it for myself, growing company, you know, solo player, I now get to do with multiple companies on a daily basis. And that's really what Hinge does. We help companies. Uh, we help companies with a an efficient and uh, and um, sustainable path to growth, and we just teach them how to do it through marketing. That's cool. Um, that's a really interesting background. <laughs> and uh, but you know, I have to say, like you know, that's how I feel about growing companies. That's uh, that's always been my passion. Um, creating something from nothing and growing it uh, has always been the thrill for me. And uh, the previous companies I've sold, it sold once it got to the point where it was like, okay, it doesn't look like that we can grow anymore. So it's time to sell because operating it wasn't of interest to me. Um, that's really where, where, uh, where my interest lies. It's just, you know, the thrill of growing something. Absolutely. Um, and that's, that's what's uh, what I find exciting as well. Yeah. Um, so cool. Yeah. And, and it's cool to see that like you're, you're not just essentially an entrepreneur, but, you know, in a business that is helping other people, you know, do, uh, you know, do the same thing and, and yeah. sort of live that passion that you have, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Absolutely. Well, should we get into our first topic? 
Let's do it. Which is um, what I'm excited to learn about because it's a couple studies um, that you guys put on at Hinge. So, um, and it reflects on 2022, which I think a lot of people are doing right now as they're planning for 2023, which we'll get into next. But could you please start off by just explaining, you know, the different studies that you did and what all you learned from them? Yeah. So one of the things I absolutely love about Hinge is that we don't just come to the market with ideas about what people should do with their marketing in order to grow. We back all of those recommendations and all of that good thinking with our own research. So we're constantly doing research and two studies we do pretty regularly. Uh, One is called high growth and that is a study of high performing firms and how they're using marketing to achieve high growth and high profit because you know, Growth really needs to be profitable growth to be good growth. And the other study that we do, uh, this is an every other year study. It's the other side of the equation. It's the buyer side. So it's called inside the buyer's brain. And it's a look at, it's, it's kind of like a mapping of how prospective clients live, think, and breathe. How do they make decisions? How do they buy? Um, how, how, what, what? keeps them up at night and how should you as a firm trying to sell to those people how do you approach your go-to-market strategy in a way that will resonate with them so those are the two studies we do can tell you all kinds of things about it but uh that's the premise of each yeah i love that that's really interesting i'd love to dive deeper into the high growth study and get an understanding of what some of the outliers may have been yeah. that you found were signals or, or mm-hmm. things that companies were doing to achieve that, that high growth in 2022? Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's, this is a really interesting study. It's in its seventh year and when we do it annually. So we've really seen some interesting shifts. And uh, one of the shifts we've seen is that high growth marketing really doesn't have to be expensive marketing. So high growth firms are investing on an average basis around 15% of their annual revenues and it doesn't include payroll. But um, of course, it's going to be different depending on, you know, have you, are you an early adopter of a tech stack or you have to spend a lot of capital there or, you know, so on. But generally speaking about 15%. And we find that the low growth or no growth firms are spending more. So in other words, it's a really they're, they're, they're approaching marketing in a totally inefficient fashion. So that's one shift that we've seen is high growth firms have figured out how to get marketing to be such an efficiently run engine. They're spending less. I mean, it's a fantastic uh, (laughs) finding. (laughs) Yes. Mm -hmm. And I would say the other thing that I think is so valuable that came out of this study is there are some distinct attributes that differentiate high growth firms from their no growth or even average growth counterparts. And I think, you know, when I think of the three probably most prominent ones, uh, number one is high growth firms uh, have a higher rate of maturity in their tech stack. And that just makes intuitive sense, right? Mm -hmm. But Uh, having data like that and science around those numbers, that really helps leaders prioritize when they're thinking about their own tech stack and what should we invest in. And it's really a non-negotiable these days, right? You've got to have Mm -hmm. automation strategies. You can't approach everything from a manual um, perspective. Otherwise you're just completely missing the boat and capping your ability to grow. Um, Another attribute is that high growth firms regularly track, monitor, and then report on KPIs well beyond how many people visited our website and how many leads are we getting? Like those are the common ones. Got to stay on top of those. But we find high growth firms are tying, they're really good at tying marketing uh, techniques and initiatives to impact metrics like What's happening to our sales cycle? Is it shortening? What's happening to our proposal value? Is it increasing? What's happening to our win rate? And so they're able to really look at 
not just how are we performing, but they're tying the type of marketing they're doing to that performance. And so that's another great, um, I think that's a hallmark of high growth companies. Because if you think about it, that makes decision-making from the leadership all the more efficient and mm -hmm. all the more uh, accurate. Um, and then the final thing that I think is interesting about high growth firms that separates them is in the type of marketing they do. So there's two things that we see high growth firms do regularly that we don't really see from their no growth counterparts. And that is, I mean, so everybody invests in content and everybody wants to have a blog out there and everybody wants to, you know, be in the content mix, not a secret, but what high growth firms are doing is investing in a certain kind of content and it's original research. I love that they're mm -hmm. doing this because you can think about it. I mean, there's so much noise out there. There's just like information pollution. And I think what everyone is hungry for is wisdom. And that's mm -hmm. a very authentic, meaningful, relevant way to interact with your audience. If you're putting out, you know, research-based wisdom, it's that that by definition is already different from just like a generically written article or blog. And yeah. so high growth firms are just getting a lot of leverage out of that. And doing that, by the way, does not have to be expensive. It sounds expensive, but it's not. Um, and then the other thing that high growth firms are doing is offering their they are, they're offering what I call free consultations or assessments. And it's basically, you know, like after a show like this, um, inviting people to get on the phone for an hour and talk about points one, two, and three, and you're very prescriptive of what you're going to talk about. The, the reason that works so well is because you're basically inviting the business development conversation faster and it's a more efficient way of having a conversation with your prospective clients because it's all about them. It's not about you and it's not a sell and it's not a demo and it's not a pitch. It's all about them. You're helping them. You know, some of the offers we do are, or let's uh, have a conversation about your 2023 planning and then talk about these five things. Or do you know how to rebrand? Talk about these four things. It's such an, effect an, an uh, effective way to get that BD conversation much earlier in the game. All really great points. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that really is. I'm, I'm like taking notes here. Yeah. Um, I, I had a question for you about that. Did Do you find that there is, um, the trends are different, whether you're looking at a company that is in the B2B space versus B2C or the trends the same? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, one of the things to note is we work primarily in the B2B and professional services space, but we do see some differences between that and B2C, even though our research doesn't focus on the B2C. And uh, I will say that in the B2C, there is a little bit more permission, if you will, to have more of a promotional aspect to your marketing and business development, whereas in professional services, and, you know, professional services is kind of like a subset of B2B. There's really no patience for that or appetite. I think that's a really uh, kind of big distinction. And, uh, you know, that's why if you look at a professional services firm website, for example, it's not going to be as flashy as a B2C one. But that's because mm -hmm. buyers aren't looking for that shiny rock. Just, they just want to be educated. Just mm -hmm. tell me what I need to know. Educate yeah. me on something. Give me a key takeaway that I can apply to my business at 6 a.m. tomorrow. That's what they want. Yeah, Absolutely. and we've, we've definitely seen some of those things in practice. I mean, this is a perfect example of this podcast. Um, you know, we do it, uh, you know, to help educate, right? And so we're bringing different people on like yourself, you know, to help educate others. Um, and we have definitely found that there are companies that respond to that and they're, they're appreciative that you're, you're helping them learn. Um, and then, you know, we've put out white papers in the past and, and I think the white paper that we put out um, uh, in 2019, I think it was about uh, companies return on ad spend and how ad fraud is affecting that. We did a ton of research uh, on our end, uh, but it was really just part of our day-to-day -day business, right? But we took the liberty to basically take that research and make it public. And, uh, and that was, uh, I think, something that a lot of people appreciated that we were able to put yeah. that out. 
It's, it's so true. And I think you're touching on something really important. That is I, marketing needs to be approached in a systematic way. It's not about like this one technique or these five, right? It's got to be a system. So you just talked about, a, you know, a white paper and a podcast and just educating the marketplace that way. If somebody happened to download the white paper and they're captivated, then they go back to your website and then they see more ways to be educated. That's really creating a well-oiled machine, if you will. And that's when marketing works at its best. Yeah. Absolutely. And you're right in terms of saying, you know, it doesn't have to be expensive. We just yeah. did a, a political survey not too long ago, a couple mm-hmm. months ago, and um, I was surprised, you know, like how how we were able to fit that into the budget, you know, so yeah. swiftly. Um, and so, you know, it doesn't always have to be expensive. You can get creative about it. And then I was also going to joke about your earlier point that um, you know, we should set up a consultation <laughs> after the deconstructing data podcast, um, because, you know, um, in all honesty, I've also read on the opposite side that like with this sort of content marketing, you don't want to approach it as a sales conversation or and you don't always necessarily want to bring on your ideal customers onto a show like this. But, um, you know, I think that it's still so new that people are still learning about it. But. Um, you know, I thought it was an interesting point that you raised. I think so. And, and you're, you're also raising a point about, you know, what a consultation is. So if it is salesy in tone, it probably will fall flat, but if it's educational in tone and it's, uh, you know, you're like, uh, saying, uh, you know, let's contact us for a free consultation. And then there's (laughs) no context to that. That's not going to work. And that would be just like, people signaling that someone's going to get a demo or if like you're a tech firm or, you know, something salesy, but if you invite somebody to a 45 minute or hour long conversation and you give them the four bullet points of what you're going to cover that relates to content that you just covered, but goes a deeper dive on their specific business. I mean, it's like they get to lay down on the proverbial couch for an hour and tell you all their ails and then you get to solve the problem. It's all focused on them. They, that's so valuable. Um, of course, subliminally it's, it, I guess it's selling, uh, but you're, you're spending your time educating them and giving them some key takeaways. I think that, you know, it's really resonating with me right now, especially as we're talking about Omni IQ, this new product that we've launched um, and how people can, you know, log in and they can get analytics on their own first party customer data. Um, And that's us giving them something and they're able to, you know, click around and learn about it. But also like in our conversations, we're able to say, can I show you complimentary analytics? Um, So, you know, we get to educate them on that. So what you're saying is really resonating with me on this. Mm -hmm. Anything else you guys want to add on inside the buyer's brain and high growth? I mean, I know they're both 2022 studies. Yeah. They're in general about reflecting on 2022 before we get into planning for 2023. Well, I'll just say, you know, the, the high growth study and some of the findings that I just walked through, that really gives us a good profile of high performing B2B professional services firms. The, uh, some interesting things from the, Um, inside the buyer's brain. So that's on the buyer side. So prospective clients and how do they behave? Uh, I think uh, the interesting findings there are number one, firms really need to be on top of what is keeping their audience up at night. Like the CEO that you're serving or the decision maker you're serving, when she or he wakes up at 2.45 a.m., cannot go back to sleep and they take that issue into the boardroom what was it? How are they defining it? And like you were just talking about a tech platform. I, this is so important because if you look across a lot of B2B messaging, it can get very technical and very jargony and very like, here's what we do. And sure, that's important at some point in the cycle. But knowing what your audience cares about, which, by the way, from this study, uh, we found that one of the top concerns is people not just talent acquisition and retention. And we know that with the great resignation, like that's no surprise that that's still on top of everyone's minds, but Mm -hmm. also keeping people efficient. I mean, we just came out of a very tumultuous 
uh, market environment and firms are really concerned about efficiency and their people being efficient. So think about a game changing proposition if a if a uh, like a, a tech platform instead of talking about all the technical features that it offers, what if the messaging is around how it makes people more efficient? Or you know, I mean, every every tech platform out there creates efficiencies. Otherwise, it wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't be in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So thinking about tying messaging to what your buyers care about is just, um, it is an art form and there's a science to it as well because you need the research to know what your audience cares about, but it's so, so important. And I think every firm should take that into their 2023 planning. That's a great point. Yeah, it's an excellent point. I mean, everyone knows that the employers get frustrated by inefficiencies, but so do employees. You know, yes. if, you're, if you're working on something and you you feel like, you know, the process is inefficient, it can be very, very frustrating. Yeah, yeah for sure. Absolutely. Well, let's move into 2023. Planning for 2023, you're already full screen, David. What would you say um, to our audience in terms of things to take into consideration with, you know, everything we've discussed and some things we haven't discussed. Um, what would you advise for 2023? You know, we always talk about it and it's, um, it's prevalent in everything that we do, which is, and, and it goes back to efficiency actually, because we're always talking to our clients about improving efficiency with respect to their, their marketing and advertising campaigns and a big part of that is how do you focus on improving your data? And so you know, we're a data company. So that's, that's for us, that's our focus. Uh, and, you know, what we have seen, and I think what everybody has seen historically in the advertising industry um, is data inefficiencies, bad data. And so we think uh, for planning for 2023, it's going to become more and more prevalent and important for companies to concentrate on improving that. Uh, and that's a big, big focus for us. And, and that's something that we talk to all of our clients about and, and obviously our capabilities in helping companies do that. That's a great point. And you can improve your return on ad spend by 43%, right? Just by cleaning your data. We were just talking about this this morning, so I couldn't help but say it. We need a graphic that comes on right when you say it that says insert plug here. <laughs> So what about you, Liz, in terms of planning for 2023, what would you tell marketers um, and what would you advise them? I think marketers need to focus on, um, I, and I'm, I'm only thinking about this because I uh, have been spending so much time talking about these two studies lately, but I would focus on two R's and that is relevance and relationship. And what I mean by relevance is to even get on a prospective buyer's radar, your brand has to be relevant. How are you relevant? Well, it's less about all the flashy salesy kind of messaging. And in fact, it's hardly at all about that. And it's more about, are you connected to what your buyers think, what they care about? Does your messaging resonate with that? When is your content focused on issues that they're actually grappling with such that when they're out there doing an online search, you would come up and you're in that dialogue. That's how you achieve relevance. So um, that's how you get on the radar. Now, how do you get selected? Well, our research shows that it's relationship and that is prioritized over expertise, but right after relationship is expertise. And this is, uh, this is a really interesting finding because uh, even a couple of years ago, relationship, or as recently as a couple of years ago, I should say, relationship wasn't a, a major criteria that prospective buyers were using when they were selecting firms. Why? Because I think the marketplace just got so crowded and, you know, everybody was kind of offering the same thing and suddenly B2B became commoditized. Mm -hmm. And then with uh, the pandemic and other kinds of market upsets, there has been so much massive <laughs> disruption that prospective clients and clients have experienced that now all of a sudden 
they value relationship because that's one less thing, one less disruption. So if you, if your firm is relevant, the good news is that buyers are favoring staying with the same firm as opposed to going out and finding like someone who's cheaper or has a new shiny widget um, or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, so uh, relevance and relationship, I would just have that be like my mantra as I go into 2023 and, you know, make sure that I would make sure my firm is prioritizing those two things. That's, that's a good point. And you make a really good point about that relationship because, you know, it's true. Once, once you build that relationship, um, you know, it's often, uh, especially when you're talking, you know, tech as well, yeah. people get very integrated. So, you know, those relationships tend to last. And so it, what's really interesting is, you know, we're always having conversations with our sales team about, okay, how can we break those relationships that, you know, other com companies have when we're trying to break into, um, you know, into a company and, you know, one, show our relevancy and, yeah. and do yeah. all of the educating we did, we're doing and all that stuff. But then you have to have the sort of the ability to break in and build that relationship so that you can ultimately you know, break the relationship that they have with their incumbent, right. you know, provider. Do you have any advice for people uh, around that? Because I think that, yeah. that that's, that's a, it can be a tough thing to crack, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's such a great question. And this is really where the way you educate the marketplace can have a humongous impact. So think about unseating an incumbent. If you have a a uh, relevant piece of research and you're producing findings from that research that are just nobody else is talking about. Um, and it doesn't even have to be research, although that's probably the most differentiating uh, type of content that really catches the attention um, such that you could kind of unseat the incumbent. But even, even writing articles or um, having a a system in place of related content. Like you have a white paper and off of that white paper, you've got a podcast series and maybe some educational webinars and some email content, but tying it all together regularly gets a theme in front of your prospective clients. And you'd be surprised at how inefficiently some firms are talking about the things that their clients care about. They're just really not, not doing it. And they're very busy talking about all the technical attributes and using as many, many, uh, you know, acronyms as they can in a blog. Um, and it just, it's, it, it doesn't resonate with the decision maker. So I, I think mm -hmm. it's through education. That's how you achieve relevance and uh, another criteria, another major criteria, especially that buyers of uh, tech services and products care about that came out in our research is uh, industry expertise and team skills. Now, you can't go on your website and say, we have the best people. Everybody says that. Nobody mm -hmm. cares. <laughs> it's, it falls flat. But the way you prove you have the best people without saying that and wasting real estate on that message is to prove it through content. Let them author the blog content, have them speak on the podcast, have them get out there as guest speakers and guest authors. And, and, and when your prospective client is out there looking around and they just keep seeing your people and they see your company's content and they just, it starts to send a very strong message that you are the leader and you are the experts. Absolutely. I always say it, it helps close the trust gap too. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, that's great. Well, Liz, you're basically just telling us that we're doing everything we right. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that is why you had me on today. right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you saw something about the show that you liked. So I'm glad that you found us and that we found you and <laughs> that here we are. Um, yeah. But in terms of planning for 2023, what else might you add? Anything else, David or Liz? Um, I don't know. I, I, I think we burned it out on my end. Um, you I know, think so. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think the only thing I, I want to like remind myself and that I brought up to you earlier this week, David, is like making sure that we tie the marketing plan to the business goals mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that everything is is itemized to a science in a lot of ways, you know, like how many users do we want to have? How much revenue do we want to expect marketing to bring in? And how are we going to do that with what plans? Um, Cause I think a lot of times it's easy to get so focused on all the tactics that we get away from, you know, the, the goals and the planning. Um, but anyway, let's get into our third topic on tech stacks. Liz, what are some of your favorite tools that keep you and your team efficient? Uh, you know, so some favorite collaboration tools I have are, I don't know if you guys use Monday, but um, it's a really effective collaboration tool when you have a lot of tasks associated with a given project and there's multiple people, uh, multiple workflows within that. And it's just like, you don't have to, um, you don't have to have been you an avid user for months and months and months to to learn it so it's really kind of intuitive um another one i love is just uh i'm a mac user so note or evernote i mean it is everything to be able to have like a a, a text platform where you can just quickly uh, put your notes as a reminder or your, you know, I, even as I was preparing for this podcast and kind of thinking through some things I'd want to make sure I bring up or preparing for a pitch um, or whatever it is and making that shareable with your team. Um, and then I think maybe a third one is, and I don't know that this platform itself is um, like the top or number one, but I think a, a project management and resource management platform. We happen to use Mavenlink, which is now Cantata. I love it. Um, our, I just, it's everything for our team to be able to manage existing projects, but also see forward and manage resources just so tightly. And it just keeps everybody feeling very sane at the end of the day um, when there's just a lot going on. I've never heard of that one. How do you spell it? Well, it's uh, K-A-N-T-A-T-A, -T -A -T -A, and it used to be Mavenlink. Yeah, so, I don't know that one either. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. I mean, there's so many out there, uh, but we graduated from one that was super clunky and really like this one. Well, hopefully I tagged the right one. So if you check the comment yeah. later, <laughs> let me know. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, very cool. Anything, any other tools anyone wants to mention? Of course, there's Omni IQ, but you know, I guess we're biased. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me check the time. So we have a little bit of time to get into some of these questions that we have toward the bottom. So I'm curious, what are some common mistakes you think and you both think businesses make when it comes to marketing? So let's start with you, Liz. Well, there's a big one. Uh, that I see and it's, it's just a it's a big gaping hole in marketing and it's it's in what I call an offer strategy or a lack thereof so an offer uh, some people call it CTAs calls to action but it's what I'm talking about is very simple and it's it's uh, creating decisions for, for your prospective client to make so if someone goes on your website for example which is the top way that they learn about you after you know, asking their peers so they're doing their due diligence. And let's say like that white paper that you referenced, let's say they, they were on your website and saw that white paper. Well, ideally uh, they would, they would see offers to related topics on the page where they're downloading that white paper so that you don't just leave them hanging. And I just see that happen across so many firms. They, they're not connecting the dots, if you will. And they're, they're putting too much on the uh, prospective client to learn and say, oh, I was interested in this. Now let me go to this part of the website and maybe I'll learn more here about X. They don't think that way. They, you need to put as much in front of them without overwhelming them as you can. So like two to three max, uh, you don't want to put five or six because they'll just get overwhelmed and bounce. But putting a couple of meaningful additional decisions that they can take or make is everything. So it's educational, not 
uh, call our 1-800 number and let's have a conversation. That's, that's not a, um, an effective offer, but another way that they can learn and go deeper in their journey of building trust with you, like closing that trust gap, like you said earlier. Absolutely. David, That's what great. about you? Um, you know, my answer is always data related, right? So, uh, <laughs> um, you know, we talk about this all the time and it's really just about companies not uh, managing or collecting first party data. And we think that that's not only super prevalent today, um, but more so going forward in the future with all the changes going on with data tracking and third party data and all that stuff. It's becoming more and more important that companies collect information about their existing customers, that they, they talk to them, they pull them, ask them questions, um, learn from them and record that information so that they can get to know their customers better. And that will help them understand who their customers are. Um, that will help them better understand who their future customers are going to be and what other products and services or enhancements or things like that, that they may need to, to, to build uh, and provide to their customers. And there's such a, a gap there in companies doing that. Yeah. And the way that they do it, you know, you can't give somebody a, a 10 page survey to, to fill out. It's just not going to happen. Um, the two people that re that fill it out will, you know, will not provide useful information to you. Um, you need to do it in, in, a, in a much more discreet manner. Absolutely. Um, so one more question before we close out. Are there any lessons you've learned along the way from past jobs or your current job that you think everyone should know? Liz, I guess we'll start with you there. Let's see. I, um, I think two things come to mind. Um, one is more like from an industry perspective, and that is study your audience. Make sure that in by the way, I'm not talking about like customer satisfaction and how happy are they with you and check the box, yes, no, indifferent. I'm talking about having a reputable third party have in-depth conversations with your audience, the ones that you want to be filling your pipeline with in the coming years and study how these people live, think and breathe, how they learn, how they make decisions. That is everything when it comes to figuring out your sales BD and marketing engines. Uh, and then the other thing that I think that is kind of broad and really applies, it's more on the people side of the equation. This could be any industry, any job. But one thing I wish I had known a long time ago is the way people approach with you and interact with you, especially when it's uh, not in a positive light, is not at all about you. And it's everything about them and what they woke up with that morning or how they feel about themselves especially as a young entrepreneur um, being, you know, uh, with much older tenured, mostly men uh, in the tech industry. Um, it was super intimidating and uh, I wish someone had told me that before. I think it would have made me feel a lot braver as I, you know, paved my path and uh, started having conversations. That's great. Exactly. About you, David? Um, well, I mean, I, I've answered this a couple of times, so I'm going to try to choose something that I, you know, say something that I haven't said before. And I think that one of the lessons that I've learned over the years, uh, especially, and then this affects me, especially being a self-proclaimed introvert, is the importance of relationships. And I think that that's certainly early on in my career. I didn't understand that, not just relationships personally, um, between individuals, but also, um, between businesses. Uh, and I think that it can't be overlooked the importance of relationships and, in, in, in growing a business, building business in sales in marketing, whatever it is, um, those relationships that you build, um, will help build your, build your company. Well, that goes right along with what Liz was talking about earlier with uh, relevance and relationships. That's right. It does. It does. Love it. Yeah. That's what made me think of it. Absolutely. 
Yeah. Definitely. Per usual, we got to learn again on the Deconstructing Data podcast. So <laughs> thanks for that, Liz. Mm -hmm. uh, but this has been a really great discussion. Um, we really appreciate you being here. Um, but in closing, I'm going to go ahead and just say, if you like the Deconstructing Data podcast, then you'll probably like Omni IQ. You might. I'm going to pull up a little image here. If you're on the podcast, then of course you can't see this, but it's a QR code that if you scan it, then you can go to Omni IQ and upload a CSV file of your customers. And then you can literally see the gender, household income, and the birth year um, in charts just to understand and get a summary explanation of who is your audience. And that's what you were talking about earlier, Liz, is understanding your audience and you know, it's it's not just what's their job title or or what's this, but what what makes them actually drive as humans. So it's all really important. And OmniIQ, you know, you can get more analytics on it. There's five thousand segments that you can pull from and better understand like who they are and um, you know what content they're into and just different things. So check it out. We would love to hear your feedback. But other than that, um, we really appreciate your time. Is there anything you want to add, David? I heard someone was going to say something as I clicked away. Nope, it wasn't me. Uh, just want to thank thank Liz uh, for joining us. Uh, I think this was a uh, you know, great conversation. I think that uh, our listeners and viewers will get to learn a lot from you, uh, just as we have. So thank you. Yeah, uh, I enjoyed it as well. Thank you both. Yes, thank you so much. Appreciate it both. And I'm going to go ahead and close this out. If you didn't notice on the screen for podcast listeners, again, you won't see the screen, but we have an Omni IQ workshop we're going to test out on Monday, December 19th at 9.30 a.m. You'll see David going through Omni IQ and getting to tell the audience all about it. So come ask some questions and see what it's all about. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.